great Colombian that he could stand here and tell us something about the latest developments of, of his work. He has been developing uh, many tools and ways of understanding quantitatively how humors evolve, things about selection. He's working in the recent years. I mean, in this last year, there were several high impact publications that he has led. And uh, some of the work that he has been doing in colorectal cancer, I think, is has been very remarkable. So I'm very happy here to introduce you, and uh, well, hope you can enjoy. Thanks a lot. And thanks for the introduction. Um, yeah, thanks for the invite to come and talk today. So I want to talk about our work trying to measure quantitatively the evolutionary dynamics um, in human cancer, so in vivo, in the, in the human body. Um, I, I think, spoke about some of this work to your meeting in Princeton, I think about a year ago, so apologies if you've seen some of this before, but there's some new bits thrown in as, as well. Um, yeah, so we're interested in this question of how tumors change over space and time, and can we quantitatively measure that? Um, I think it's always best to start by thanking the people who actually did the work. So most of what I'm going to talk about has been done by Mark, who um, passed his PhD vibe in the lab last week, so he's now Dr. Mark Williams. Congratulations to him. Um, it's a close collaboration with Andrea Sotariva, who some of you will know, who's a physicist and cancer biologist who works in a different institute in London. We collaborate very closely. Ben is a postdoc with Andrea, another physicist um, working on cancer evolution. Chris Barnes is a, a Bayesian statistician at UCL, so it's a really interdisciplinary, um, multi institution kind of project we work together. We also work with Christina Curtis, and I'm sure many of you know, in, in Stanford. Um, some of the specific experiments that I'll show you have been done by Annie Baker and, and Danny Tempico, who are both lab members, and it's funded by CIUK and by Solar. Okay, so we're interested in this, this question of how do um, cancers grow? It's a very kind of generic question, and I'm still surprised that we don't really know the answer generally, particularly for solid tumours. Um, we're of course, particularly interested in, in human cancer, and for obvious reasons, it's much harder to watch in humans longitudinally a cancer growing. Um, you know, some of these uh, things are slightly easier in, in model systems, but even then, it's very difficult to longitudinally observe uh, cancer growth. And so, um, we come at this from an evolutionary point of view, of course, um, and we're trying to quantitatively understand the contributions of, of different parts of the evolutionary process to, to, to driving tumor growth. And so I think broadly, if you break down from a kind of population genetics view, cancer or evolution in general into these different components. And in cancer, this one on the right, the role of selection has received a lot of attention in cancer. You know, for good reason. We're interested in finding those genes which cause some functional change which drive uh, tumor evolution. Um, Lots and lots of energy has been invested in understanding this component. But I'd argue that we've maybe neglected um, the role of, of random chance of stochastic effects in, in, in shaping tumor evolution. And I think if we take those more stochastic events into account, we can get a clearer picture of, of what's going on and particularly understand um, uh, more quantitatively the patterns of heterogeneity um, within and across tumor type. So that's a real emphasis of what we're doing. So that randomness, I think, comes in two forms. There's the randomness of just mutation in general, which I think is quite well studied. Lots of people are interested in the mutation rate. But this bit in the middle about the role of genetic drift, the stochastic um, effects that affect which cells will proliferate and produce surviving offspring in any generation. And some of that is driven by selection, but some of it is just random chance. One cell might get lucky for some you know, local fluctuation in the in the growth factors it experiences or something. You know, nothing special about the cell, it's just lucky in its current environment it makes it produce more offspring. And this, this stochasticity can really shape, I think, what's going on. And that's something we try to quantitatively measure. Um, of course, the microenvironment plays strongly into all of these different factors. And the talk I'll give is really genetics focused, but that's only because that's what we're um, capable of measuring, but it's not to say that the microenvironment isn't really important, it's just much more difficult to quantitatively characterize. So I fully recognize that the microenvironment plays directly into these different factors. Yeah, so broadly speaking, these two stochastic um, influences on evolution are summed up and they can give us neutral dynamics, and that's something we're particularly interested in. in <coughs> 
Okay, so we're interested in the question of how, how cancers uh, grow, and how they change over space and time. And if you kind of look in a textbook, it looks like this is a solved problem, and this is the kind of standard model of, of how cancers evolve. And so this is um, a version of those famous cuerograms from the, from, from the famous evolutionary biologist uh, applied to cancer. So this is a graph of time on the x against the size of the cloud on the y. And the idea is that cancer starts to grow following the acquisition of some key mutation. So in the case of colon cancer, my, my preferred kind of tumor to study, that would usually be um, uh, inactivation of the usual function of APC, this tumor suppressor gene. And that drives a large plane of expansion. So that activation, inactivation of APC is strongly selected. And so that, in the case of colon cancer, would give us a benign tumor called an adenoma. Um, and then what we're interested in is how you go from a benign lesion through to a malignant lesion capable of spreading around the body. And so the kind of standard model of tumor evolution would say, well, that's driven by um, further sequential acquisition of other driving mutations that are each strongly selected and each drive a big clone expansion. So in colon cancer, there would be genes like KRAS and P53 in particular, copy number alterations in the genome. So you get this kind of simple, almost linear-like dynamic where you can work out how far along you are towards cancer by counting the driver mutations. And each driver mutation has a really transformative effect on the, on the clonal structure and, and the genetic identity of the tumor. So we've been interested in if that really is the, the dynamics that we see if we measure dynamics individually in individual tumors. It's worth saying that this kind of model has been uh, postulated from cross-sectional data. So you can sequence lots of tumors of different type, of different stages, and ask well, what mutations do they have, and then try and put that cross-sectional data together into a time series. That's a challenging thing to do. So our approach is to try and just measure that time directly in, in individual tumors. Um, <clears throat> okay, so that's a hard thing to do, and you know, the next slide is a bit gory, so if you're squeamish, then, then look away. This is the problem that we face. So this is a human colon cancer, a big ugly colon cancer. And this is the problem, not meant as such a glib statement, this is the problem because this is all we can ever measure. We can only ever measure at the end of the process. We can't watch the tumor develop in you know, for obvious reasons. And so we're only able to get data from this snapshot, one single snapshot in time in most cases. And then we need to infer the dynamics. We need to get temporal data from this, this snapshot. And so our way of trying to do that is to use intratumor heterogeneity, which we know is, is prevalent across all tumors of every type, as a secret diary recording how a tumor grew. And so I think it's, you know, lots of people work in this kind of space. And I think it's a really analogous um, thing to understanding how a tree grew and the secret information recorded in the rings of that tree. You can imagine the width of the ring in a particular year tells you how much the tree grew in that year. And you can learn something about the environment that that tree was in in that year by perhaps taking a sample of the ring and looking for mineral content or something in the ring of the tree. So there's a secret ancestry written in, in, in these patterns inside the, inside the tree. And I think the same thing is written into the genome. There's a secret history written of how that tree grew written into, um, into the genome, into the pattern of tumor heterogeneity. So, more specifically, the patterning looks like this. So, this is a, a cartoon of tumor growth. And so, what we're interested in, in trying to measure is what's the dynamics of subclones within a tumor? Can we say something quantitative about how new mutations arise in a tumor and how they spread through that tumor? And so, to measure those dynamics, we use somatic mutations as a natural kind of lineage tracing um, um, method to to track the evolution of those clones. And so, kind of in very simple form, this is what uh, cancer growth must look like. So cancer growth starts with a single cell. That first cell founding the cancer has lots of mutations already, and there's some evolutionary process which has happened, um, which led to all those mutations accruing in that first cell of the tumor. And so we don't claim to be able to measure that process. But what we're interested in trying to measure is what happens thereafter, after this cancer starts to grow. So in my cartoon, all of those mutations that have been accrued by that first cancer cell are denoted, uh, denoted by that letter C. So C is a lots of mutations that might be in that first cancer cell. And so for tumors to grow, that first cell has to at some point produce two surviving offspring. And then 
you would imagine those two surviving offspring at some point have to produce more surviving offspring and so on, and the population has to grow for a tumor to be. And so each time the cell divides, the mutation rate of cancer cells seems to be quite high. There's new mutations introduced into the genome, and those new mutations uniquely mark different lineages in the tumor. And so if we want to ask the question, well, what was the evolutionary fate of this particular cell, this clone in the tumor, it suffices to ask, well, what happened to the mutations that uniquely mark that cell? In this case, we're asking, well, what happened to that blue hexagon mutation in this trace of the dynamics of that, that mutation? And so that's exactly what we do. We try and quantitatively understand the, the distribution of clone sizes within tumors as a readout of the evolutionary dynamics that, that, that led to the growth of that tumor. And so the data we work with is um, next generation sequencing data. And we tend to think of it in terms of these um, varied allele frequency histories. Um, in evolutionary ecology, they're called the site frequency spectrum, usually. Um, <coughs> so these kinds of data are naturally produced by next generation sequencing. And I suspect everyone's familiar with them, but if anyone's not, I'll just talk you through it, because otherwise the rest of the talk would be really painful. Um, so th this is a histogram on the x-axis. You've got a fraction of reads, allele frequencies showing the mutation. Um, and on the y-axis, you've got the number of mutations at that frequency. Um, and so, um, you know, normal human cell is diploid, so a mutation, all these C mutations, if this tumor is diploid, should be on one allele or the other, so they should have an allele fraction of 0.5. Um, they don't have an allele fraction of 0.5, it's a bit less. This, this first hump is all those mutations denoted by this letter C. Um, it's diluted down to lower frequency because of the non tumor cells in the tumor, or the stroma, and all the, the microenvironmental cells, which are very much part of the tumor, but they're genetically wild types, so they dilute out to this genetic signal. So those mutations there, at this high frequency clone peak, they don't tell us anything about the evolutionary dynamics of subclones, because they're all the mutations which are fixed in that first cancer cell. What we're interested in understanding is the pattern of tumor heterogeneity. So we're interested in this patterning of subclonal mutations, this, this distribution of mutations are in some but not all of the tumor cells is our quantitative measure of tumor heterogeneity. And we're interested in what this kind of shape, how this shape is determined, how this patterning of, of tumor heterogeneity is determined by how the cancer evolved, by the, by the evolutionary dynamics of tumor growth. Just, I think this will be obvious to you all, but just to say that the lack of mutations at very low frequency is not because the mutations aren't there, it's just that we can't detect them. It's uh, limited because of limited sequencing depth and the sensitivity of, of the sequencing capacity. Okay, so what we're interested in doing is saying, well, how does this um, distribution of subclonal variant allele frequencies, um, how is that determined by different patterns of tumor evolution and can we quantitatively um, infer how a tumor evolved from this pattern of tumor heterogeneity? And so um, our approach to do that is to make uh, mathematical, simple mathematical models of tumor evolution. We use uh, stochastic branching process models and then uh, simulate the model and predict that pattern of variant allele frequencies in the tumor and do inference to say, well, which, which model of tumor evolution best explains the data that we observe. And so in that way, we can um, quantitatively link the pattern of tumor heterogeneity to the, to the underlying evolution of dynamics. So we kind of nickname this approach physical bioinformatics because it's a bioinformatics-based approach, but it's conditioned on it, this physical model of cell division. You know, we physically, physically if you like, we build a computer, but we simulate the process of cells dividing and producing offspring. You know, and that's like this physical process that underlies tumor growth. We try and condition our analysis of the genetic data on that physical process. And I think this is a really I'm really excited about this technique. I think it's a nice thing to do. I hope that I can show you why. All right, so the first question we asked a couple of years ago now was, um, what happens if no interesting evolution happens at all? Um, you know, how much heterogeneity should we expect in the absence of selection? <coughs> I think we kind of recognize that tumor heterogeneity is inevitable. There's all these independently dividing, evolving cells in a tumor and they want to independently acquire mutations. And so that should naturally generate lots of tumor heterogeneity. So the question is, how much heterogeneity should we expect if there's no selection shaping that tumor at all? 
So no selection is neutral evolution in, in um, molecular evolution in general. That's the null hypothesis in molecular evolution. And so we wanted to ask, well, how well does the null hypothesis of molecular evolution explain the patterns of heterogeneity that we, we see in cancer? And so we took this approach in making the mathematical model. So we made a, a simple mathematical model of neutral evolution in a growing population, in a growing tumour. So the model is very simple. So we just have exponential growth. We have this birth-death process with cell doublings. We have no selection. So all the cells have the same probability of producing surviving offspring per unit of time. And we have a constant mutation rate. Uh, so perhaps on the distribution of mutations per cell division. So we start with the first single transformed cancer cell. Remember that cell already has lots of mutations. We're not interested in those. We're just interested in how the mutations that occur during tumor growth, um, which lead to intratumor heterogeneity, how they, how they occur. So in the simple model, that first cell divides to produce two surviving offspring. Um, in this cartoon, I set the mutation rate to one mutation per cell per division. So now you can imagine there's two new mutations in the population and they're both at frequency at half, so in one cell or the other. So you can plot a graph of the number of mutations at frequency f. So you can imagine what happens next. So those first two cells divide and produce four cells. Now there's four new mutations in the population, frequency a quarter, um, and so on and so on and so on. And so you get the simple relationship where there's ever many more mutations at ever lower frequency um, under neutral evolution as the tumor grows. Um, so the mass of these, um, these branching processes are, are, are somewhat subtle, I think. And so you get slightly different results if you don't have uh, synchronous cell divisions. The result you end up with um, is that the cumulative number of mutations at frequency f is proportional to 1 over that frequency. Um, it's a linear relationship, so it scales with the ploidy of the cells in a deterministic way. And you, it's kind of, it's just, if the ploidy is higher, the effectively the mutation rate higher, is higher. It just scales the relationship between allele frequency and clone size. Um, and then the gradient of the line is this mu over beta term, where mu is the mutation rate per cell division, and beta is the, um, is the effectively the death rate, the probability that two cells produce surviving offspring. And so um, we can't independently determine these two parameters, but we can look at what the, the gradient of the line is as a measure of this effective mutation rate, we call it. It's the mutation rate per um, divisions, which lead to two surviving offspring in the tumor. So it's the mutation rate per cell per tumor doubling is what we can infer from this. This is nice, I think, because this gives us a quantitative prediction, you know, a simple mathematical model about what the distribution of tumor heterogeneity should look like in tumor under neutral evolution. And it's very testable against the data, of course, because we naturally measure this, this distribution of, um, of clone size through next generation sequencing. And so we then went to real data and said, well, how often does this model seem to fit the data? So this histogram I showed you before is um, some deep whole genome sequencing from a, um, from a stomach cancer from this lovely paper a few years ago. Um, and so what we did is ask of the subclone mutations, how often do they follow this one over f like distribution? So that's what you see on the right is the inverse allele frequency on the x-axis against the cumulative number of mutations of that frequency on the y. And you can see in this case the line is very, very straight. And so in this case we can't reject the normal model. So in this case it seems neutral evolution is an entirely adequate description of the pattern of heterogeneity that we see in this tumor. Um, and then of course we can ask, well, what's the gradient of the line? Um, and that gives us a measure of that effective mutation rate per cell division. Um, so as you will all know, um, there's loads and loads of uh, cancer genome data publicly available now. So um, at the time, the TCGA was the very kind of best source of these data. And so we went to TCGA and we said, well, how often do we see this 1 over f uh, pattern in the, in the data? <coughs> um, so that's what you see on the right. But at the time, we used this simple r squared statistic to say how straight is the line. It took a very high value of r squared as a kind of finally discriminated between the line being straight or not. And there's better ways to do that than we can subsequently. So this is a plot of different tumor types. There are squared values, and this red line is our cutoff for it being straight enough for us to say we can't reject the normal model. And to our surprise, we found that in about 30% of tumors across um, all the different types, uh, we couldn't reject the normal model. So 
look like Nietzsche's evolution was an adequate explanation of the data in a high um, proportion of cases, a significant minority of cases. <coughs> and I think at the time that was a real surprise, I think because of such focus on the importance of driver genes and I think maybe an assumption that all of the heterogeneity that we observe in cancer must be in some way functionally significant. We um, suggested here that it was this genetic heterogeneity at least was just um, a kind of passenger effect of the neutral evolution. Um, so on the right you see the, the gradients of that line in all these different cases for the cases where we, the, the line is straight. And so this is the effective um, a mutation rate per, per division of these to two surviving offspring. And it kind of makes sense. So in melanoma, where you might imagine the mutation rate is high because of UV exposure, we measure a high effective mutation rate. And the same in lung, where you might also imagine the mutation rate is high because of smoking. So it kind of makes sense. Um, so yeah, in about 30 different cases, uh, this neutral model couldn't be rejected. All right, so rather than this, this selective sweep model, I think. The neutral model looks very much like this, this big bang model that um, was postulated by Christina and Daryl Shabata and Andrea Sotoriba uh, uh, the year before um, Jimbra. So in the big bang model, all the selection um, happens on that first cell. So that first cell has all those important mutations um, which are very positively selected and the tumor grows out. And within that positively selected population, all of the cells are equal to one another. And so um, new mutations which arise um, have a negative effect on fitness and so don't drive a, a big clone expansion. So this means that the clone size distribution at the end is determined just by when mutations showed up, not by how strongly selected those mutations were at all. And in some sense, this is a, an inevitability of, 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 of exponential growth of tumors. So if the tumor population is um, growing quickly and, and it's already quite large, then the selective advantage that a new mutant has to have in order to become great and appreciable size in that population is absolutely vast. So in some sense, the fat tumors grow at all is suppressive of selection. Do you see any changes in these distributions by the annotation of the mutation themselves? And so a exotic versus not, CBG versus not? Non drivers. <coughs> True. So I think broadly, no. It doesn't matter what kind of mutations you use. So you can, if you take whole genome sequence data from a subset, different bits of the genome. Say you just did the analysis on one chromosome, you get the same answer as if you did the analysis on a different chromosome or whole genome. Um, related to that, so you do see mutations which might be annotated as drivers in some clone occasionally, um, but they don't cause a deviation from this normal distribution. So. That, that's an important point because this method is agnostic to the cause of selection. So if you're trying to define selection by looking for the driver, you have to find that driver. Yeah. But here, you, you're not looking for the driver, you're just looking for the influence of selection. Um, I'll talk a little in a moment about quantitatively what selection looks like in the distribution, but if selection is there, it's not one over F-like, and so you see the influence of it even if you don't want the cause. Okay, um, so we thought this was interesting and so we tried to look for subclonal drivers and say um, how often do we find them. So colon cancer is my um, preferred uh, <coughs> cancer to study for lots of reasons. And recently we did some multi-region genome or axiom sequencing in colon cancers and we built phylogenetic trees in the way that lots of people do. Um, and on those trees we annotated all of the mutations we thought were likely to be drivers in, in colon cancer. And nearly every single driver we found was truncal. It was not subclonal in colon cancer. And colon cancer is one of the cancers that seems to have a very high proportion of cases consistent with the neutral model. So these two bits of data were self consistent with one another. We also have been working with a company to develop methods to do in situ detection of point mutations. So we, there's a company called ACD. Um, advanced cell diagnostics, and they have a technology called Basecode, which is essentially lets you do fish, but for point mutations. Um, and so we use this Basecode technology, and 
um, probe for these different driving mutations in different tumours, um, we have a set of probes for a range of different mutations. Um, and so what we did is take a large cohort of cancers where we had some deep targeted sequencing already and selected cases where there was likely to be a subclinal driver. And there weren't very many cases in that cohort. And so these are some of those cases. And then we used the base scope assay to probe that subclone that we thought was there. So what you're seeing here, so the uncolored cells, the uncolored cells are stromal non-tumor cells. The yellow regions are tumor cells which don't bear the mutation. And the red regions are tumor cells which do bear the mutation. So in all these cases, we think these are um, you know, likely to be driving mutations, but still the subclone seems to be quite spatially restricted. And that's again consistent with this, this big bang like, model of what's going on. And so you know, these are just corroborative things that the idea of neutral dynamics isn't, isn't outlandish in, in cone cancer at least. All right, so that's fine. So, there's neutral dynamics sometimes, but the majority of cases that we looked at rejected the normal model, and so we would conclude then that there's some evidence of subclonal selection. And so I think the more exciting question is, what can we say quantitatively about the influence of selection? Can we measure what that fitness advantage of subclones is in these, in these data? So that's something we wanted to do. So from an evolutionary point of view, what does positive selection do? Positive selection just leads to the clone or the lineage that's been positively selected becoming more common than you'd expect by chance. And here, chance is under the neutral model of neutral evolution. And so, you know, by deduction, then you'd expect that um, <coughs> under positive selection, you would always reject this neutral model. Right? So you get some different distribution. So just an example that selection really does lead to mutations being more common. This is that base scope assay again, probing for KRAS mutations in colon cancers that have been treated with cetuximab, which is an anti-EGFR um, antibody. Um, and resistance to cetuximab is through, uh, commonly through KRAS mutation. So these are all tumors which were wild type for KRAS mutation prior to therapy. Therapy is given in a neoadjuvant setting and then um, there was a resection done after the, the new version of therapy and we looked for KRAS mutation in those tumours. So they were initially wild type and post-therapy they are all kind of raging full of, of KRAS mutation so you see this clone expansion um, presumed due to positive selection um, and these KRAS mutations. Of course that selection might be that the KRAS clone grew more in the therapy but it's probably that it didn't die. So it was there before and we just killed off the um, interestingly as well, just in our um, colorectal cancer multivision sequencing study, we also had some adenomas, so some of these early colon tumors. Interestingly, those early adenomas have roughly the same <coughs> mutation burden as, as the cancers and the same number of driver mutations, but the driver mutations tend to be much more frequently subclonal than adenomas. So these are these trees again, and the relative to the drivers, and you can see there's quite a few examples of potential subclonal driver mutations. Particular known as a subclonal genome doubling as well. Okay, so we definitely see you know, evidence of selection by orthogonal means in the data sometimes. So, what can we say quantitatively about selection by looking at the VAP distributions in these cases? So, our approach again is to make these simulations of tumor growth and then condition them on the data and quantitatively try and measure the dynamics. And so, the Models of selection look like this. You've seen the neutral model already, where we've just a series of cell doublings, and every new mutation just labels um, one of the lineages in the tumor. So the difference for non neutral growth for, for selection is that we have tumor growing with some cell doublings going on, and then at some point, one of the cells in the tumor experiences positive selection. So that might be because of the mutation that lineage gets, or it might be because of some other extrinsic factor like who that cell's next to or the environment that it's in. But whatever the cause, this lineage becomes selected and then the result of that selection is that that lineage becomes overrepresented in the final tumor population. Um, and so this signature of overrepresentation is what we look for to try and find selection in, the, in those back distribution. And so we quantify selection by the parameter S and we think about it as a 1%. And it's just by the ratio of the growth rate of the mutant um, lambda mutant over the 
kind of host the residual non-mutant tumor cells in the population. So we're interested in trying to infer this value of S from the data. What's the fitness advantage of those subclones in tumors? So we do these kinds of branching process simulation, and then we want to be able to compare it to the genetic data. The genetic data, as you will all know, is full of many sources of noise, and so this kind of analytical approach that we took before has some merit to it, because it's you know, kind of mathematically um, simple and um, very kind of understandable from that point of view, but it also doesn't handle all the errors in the data very well, so you end up not fitting the model very often because of sources of error that you haven't modeled. And so to get around that, we use a simulation-based approach where we try and we simulate the tumor, and then we simulate all the various sources of error we can think of that, that kind of perturb the signal that we see. So most of the areas are about sampling, so we sample a limited population of the tumor cells, do a virtual digest and take a limited number of those alleles proportional to our sequencing depth. So there's two sampling processes going on here, and then that allows us to reconstruct this, and we also encourage a low detection limit, and that allows us to produce synthetic back distributions that somewhat reflect the underlying errors that are inherent to those kinds of data. All right, so we wanted to know what do the VAP distributions look like in the selection. So you've seen the neutral case already where you get ever more mutations at ever lower frequency. And so under selection, you see a different picture. This is more subconference. Single subconference. Single subconference, yeah. Um, yeah, you get, it's related the answer you get with multiple subclones. So with a single subclone, you get one extra peak in this distribution. And this peak is, is the signature of selection, but this peak is produced because um, a load of mutations have been acquired um, during the evolution of this lineage to the point where the subclone becomes positively selective. And then all of the mutations acquired along this lineage in the tree are dragged to higher frequency in the tumor than you expect under the neutral model because of selection. So that's what this peak is. This peak is all of the mutations that are in this first founder cell of the clone that are dragged to higher frequency by selection. So that's what you're that's what you're seeing there. Importantly, you still always see this neutral one over f like tail, even when selection is present, and that's just because there's still neutral evolution going on. So there's neutral evolution within the subclone, and also within the non-subclone parts of the tumor. So that always still produces the tail. Really, the tail is a good way to think about the tail is it's just the signature of tumor growth. It should always be there in all tumors, just because that tumor has grown. Okay. And so I think another important point here is that we, we talked about it a little bit in your question, but you see selection in the data not because you're measuring the drivers, but because you see an over-representation of all of the passengers that are in the selected clone. So it's the passenger mutations which are abundant, which gives you the real power to detect selection rather than looking for the drivers themselves. Okay, and of course you can design a statistical test that says, does my distribution look like a neutral case or not? a way to detect selection. Um, and so that's what we did to start with. We asked the question, well, how much selection are we powered to detect in sequencing data? And so that's what we see in this plot. This is a graph of the selective advantage of the subclone to all the simulation um, against the time at which that subclone entered the population. And the color here is a measure of the deviation from the, from the normal neutral model using various statistics. And you can see there's only a small wedge of parameter space, we can nickname it the wedge of selection, where you're able to um, confidently reject the normal model. And so broadly speaking, you can only see selection if it's strong or early. Um, but you'll notice that this bottom right-hand corner of the plot where selection is really strong and really early, you also can't reject the uh, neutral model. And that's because down here, the tumor is actually evolving neutrally again because the selected subclone is swept through the whole population or near to fixation anyway. And so the actual dynamics we're measuring are the neutral dynamics within that selected subclone. So this tells you that you've actually really got quite a small window to, to catch selection in the act, if you like, when it becomes actually patterns of tumor heterogeneity with respect to the tumor. So you're making an assumption that there's a constant rate of mutation, uh, mutations per cell mutation. Yeah. How sensitive, uh, have you explored sensitivity to that assumption? Um, so but um, if that assumption isn't true, then you see it straight away in the data because from the in the neutral case, you know that the number of mutations of frequency f is linearly proportional to the mutation rate. So if you get a change in the mutation rate, you see a spike in the distribution. 
So the question then becomes about whether or not you can distinguish selection from the change in the mutation rate. Um, and you, you probably can because you don't get the peak so much because you then change the shape of the tail. So that's an area that I think we need to explore some more, but I think it's tractable. It's a good point. All right, so this tells us what we should be able to measure, but what we want to do is try and quantitatively be able to infer those selective advantages. Um, and so we do this using statistical inference, um, but I want to try and give you a, an analytical feel for how it works, because you know, the idea, I think, is, is quite simple, and, and I, I like it. Um, so this is a simulated tumor where we have the subclone here. And so we want to know when did this subclone show up and how strongly selective is it? And so that first question of when did it show up, we can work out by asking how many mutations are in the subclone. So if the subclone showed up really early in tumor evolution, it wouldn't have many unique mutations. There wouldn't have been much time elapsed until the subclone arrived. It wouldn't have many mutations. Whereas if it showed up late, it lots of time elapsed, it would have lots of mutations. And that's a linear process. So we just have the mutation rate here times the age of the clone. It's the, it's the number of mutations. So that gives us a quantitative measure of when the clone showed up. Um, we can measure this mutation rate from the shape of the tail, as I showed you before. And so the other question of how selectively advantageous is that clone? Well, that um, can be read out by the um, proportion of the tumor occupied by the clone. So we have this model of competing exponentials. You know, the subclone is growing exponentially, and the tumor is growing exponentially, and the subclone must be growing faster. So we can write down the fraction in terms of these exponentials, and, and this top line is proportion of tumor represented by the subclone, and that has this one process term in, so we start to be able to do the inference. Okay. And so yeah, mutation rates in the So we don't do it with this analytic thing because of all the sources of noise. We actually do it using ABC with Simon Tabaret's um, approximate phase implementation method, which I suspect you're familiar with, but just if you're not, it's a really cool method where you have a your phasing method, you're sampling from a prior distribution, and you want to estimate some parameters and theta. In, it. in our case, those parameters are the fitness advantage of the subclone and the time it showed up and some other ones too. And so we sample them from the prior, we simulate our model and with that sample from the prior, and we produce some simulated data, which we then compare to the actual data we have for a tumor. This is all you know, tumor by tumor inference. And if the data matches the observation, then we accept those parameters into the posterior. Um, and if they don't match, we throw them away. And we just go round and round and round the circle millions of times until we've built up a good approximation to the posterior distribution. And so that's what you see in these slides. These are real sequencing data, again, from three very prominent um, studies where there's very high quality, very high depth sequencing data from different cancer types. Um, the gray bars are the real data. Um, and the red line is the fit, the inferred fit of the model to the data. So you can see the fit is quite good in all of the cases. Um, there's a really small number, so there's a fitness advantage of the subplane, the mutation rate, the time which the subplane shows up. Um, they're the only parameters, and then we, they lead us to try and estimate where the subclones are in the distribution of that kind of yeah, number. Yeah, that's a good advantage, that's true. And so we limit the inference to two or less at the moment, because um, we haven't seen cases where there's good evidence of multiple problems in the distribution. Um, one of the things we're working on is, is analytical forms of the distribution with more subclones, to work Simon's done with the as well. I think that might be useful there. But if you get limited by power, by the shape of how well you can resolve the distribution, given the sequence. Um, yeah, so we also independently estimate the number of clones. <coughs> So we do the fit, and then once we've done the fit, we know what the, um, the parameters are, of course, that gave us that good fit. We have the posterior distributions, and so we can plot them. And so these are the posterior distributions for the inferred fitness of the subclones at the time at which the subclones emerged. Time's always measured in units of tumor doubling. Um, and you know, these were a surprise when I saw them. So the um, fitness coefficients are really high that we measure. They're like 30%. If you think about that compared to, say, classic pop gen, where the selection coefficients are tiny, you know, we knew already we wouldn't be able to detect tiny coefficients in the data, but the coefficients we did measure were massive. They're like 100 times bigger than that. So it looks like even in established tumors, there can be huge selective advantages that subclones can experience. It's a really interesting.
interesting. Um, so there's loads of data out there. This is TCGA, colon cancer data that's sufficient to high depth and, and cellularity. So we fit it into lots of different tumors. And um, these are some of the answers. So these are the proportions of tumors where we see evidence of a subclone that's positively selected. The blue ones here, interestingly, are all the uh, all from this MET 500 cohort, which is deep whole exome sequencing in lots of METs. Um, and even in metastatic lesions, we can find evidence of differentially selected subclones. So even at this very late stage of tumor evolution, still big subclones, positively selected subclones can emerge. And the advantage of those subclones can be massive still. And so, I mean, I fully recognize that the, our ability to detect here is limited. We can only detect things with a big effect. But those things with a big effect, those clones that experience big gains of fitness are definitely there in the data uh, sometimes. Okay, so um, um, so this I think is, is kind of cool. We can measure these selective advantages from sequencing data and get this handle on the dynamics. But what, why, why should we care? Like what, what would we do with that dynamic information? And so I think the excitement is about trying to use it to predict what a cancer is going to do next, trying to predict the evolution trajectory of the tumor. Um, so the approach here is to take the genome sequencing of the data, do inference to learn the evolutionary parameters, and then once you have these parameters, you can feed them back into the model and make a mechanistic forecast. You can say, well, what's the tumor going to do next? And so we tried that. So this is it. in a simulation case. We evolved a tumor and sampled it at some point in time, and this was the vast distribution we sampled in our simulation. And then we do the inference on that distribution to measure the parameters. <coughs> so this is the time course of the simulation. We grew the tumor to take a sample from this point in time. Uh, we measure the dynamics of that subclone, and then we infer forwards. So this is, this is the growth of that subclone. And um, we infer forwards in time what the subclone is going to do. And the purple gray region is our confidence interval on the estimate. It works well in this simulation case. <coughs> it didn't be worried. And of course, we can do the same thing in real data. So this is the AML case again. So we do the inference, we measure the fitness of these different subclones, and then we have a prediction about the future, interestingly also about the dynamics in the past. So what we predict here is that the um, large subclone, this one, is in the ascendancy and is actually going to sweep through and take over the tumor going forwards, whereas the minor subclone is already on its way out. And you know, this is just a kind of toy example from my point of view. But you might imagine that if you had differential treatments for different you know, subclones in the tumor, this might help you inform which ones to give. Um, and also, let's move this down. Can you relate this to your development to uh, real time? Mm -hmm. Or do you just say, well, we have a year or something like this? Yeah, you need to know, have an independent measure of the mutation yeah. rate. So, because this thing that we can only measure the mutation rate per effective cell division, that's why everything is measured in units of cell doubling because it's the effective cell division rate. Right? So you get it. You have one of the reasons that you can do that. Is So in fact, going forward, that might be something we should think about. So we'd love to try and develop this and, and validate some of these predictions. Um, and so the model where we're starting to try and do this is in colorectal cancer. So there are some colorectal cancer patients who have a primary tumor which is resected, and then later on they'll have liver mets, which again are you know, resected. Um, and, but then they'll keep coming back, so they, they won't be cured, and they might later period of time have some more liver mets. This is the time course for an actual patient. And so we can end up sampling that same tumor population at multiple points in time. So obviously these patients are relatively rare, but they do give us these time course where we can both validate predictions and perhaps learn more about the dynamics from these kinds of time course data. Um, okay, I think I was gonna talk for a couple of minutes about alternative methods of selection, but I think I, I won't. So um, with that bit I've just skipped, if we put it all together, I think this is my speculation about what the distribution of fitness effects looks like in cancer. Um, from, from these frequency bits methods I showed you, we can measure 
that there exists some subclonal drivers in this kind of region of parameter space, um, which are really quite strongly selected in, <coughs> in, in, in cancers. And I suspect that there are some even strongerly, more strongly <coughs> selected subclonal drivers that we just never see as being subclonal drivers because they always sweep through the population really quickly. So they're up here. I'd be really surprised if there aren't a load of weak drivers there, which really, in a sense, don't do so much. They don't pattern the tumor heterogeneity to a sufficient extent for us to be able to detect that differential patterning. And so vice versa, I'd expect that to be true for negative selection too. There's probably lots of weakly negatively selected mutations which don't cause significant deviation. And detecting is very rare. Um, the very strongly selected negative mutations should be possible because they should be conspicuous by their absence. You know, this idea that some mutations never happen. Um, other people are working on that idea. So this is my kind of hand-wavy argument about what I think the overall distribution of fitness effect looks like. In mutations in All right, so I'll conclude by saying that these, this approach of this physical bioinformatics approach shows us how the pattern of intertumor heterogeneity can be very much shaped by the physical process of tumor growth and subclonal um, evolution. And using this quantitative mathematical modeling approach, we can read out the dynamics from the data. We see that mutual evolution explains, in a large proportion of cases, the um, pattern of heterogeneity that we see, at least to the extent where we're not powered to reject the normal model. Um, and that has implications for how we understand the clonal structure of tumors. For the broad distribution of fitness effect, but we see these very strongly selected drivers in, in subclonal drivers in tumors sometimes. And I think if we know this quantitative stuff about the parameters of tumor evolution that allows, enables this, this mechanistic forecasting of, of how tumors will evolve next. <coughs> Thanks a lot. So in terms of the subclonal selection, I know you didn't talk much about the microenvironment, but uh, do you think, and you gave an example of tetramath, I think, is, is one of the selection. What about <coughs> metastasis? And so for example, you could just went through briefly the, the liver metastatic model. Do you think that the subclones that are selected in the liver are different than the subclones in the primary tumor, or if there are other meds, lung, or bone, that there's also going to be selection based on the local microenvironment rather than other types of competition? Yeah, I'd, I'd, absolutely. I'd be really surprised. So I think a way of phrasing it mathematically is, is that selective coefficient of value that's the same for that same sort of claim in all environments. And I, I'm sure it won't be. So the advantage that itself has is going to be context dependent. But I'm sure. I think this, this kind of method, one of the very weaknesses and strengths of it is that it's completely agnostic in a sense about the underlying biology. Like it doesn't matter why it's supposed selected, you still see the same happening in the data. So all we're able to do with this is to say, you know, what's the selection, how strong is it, what's the mechanism of that. We can't learn from these kinds of data alone. I mean, maybe do it from looking at the genetic mutations that are present in the subclone, um, doing that kind of functional understanding of the variation, but not from this purely quantitative understanding of the allele frequency. So, uh, from your simulation, uh, can you say that the sequential model and the big plan model can be explained? Because if you see the graph on two slides before, the, the, the most um, the most potent uh, mutations might give the sequential mutation model, but the weaker mutations could explain the big plan model. So, can, can this simulation yeah, so yeah, I think that's a good point. So I think the way I would summarize it is to say something which sounds stupid, but I don't think it is, which is that when there's neutral evolution or a big bang like dynamic, we're saying, really all we're saying is that there hasn't been any strong selection since there was last strong selection. Yeah. And so sure, there can be a history of strongly selected drivers that happen one after the other and sweep through the population. Um, but and they definitely do not dispute that whatsoever. But I think the conclusion is that if we take a tumor in front of us and we ask, is the <coughs> structure of that tumor determined by these um, systems of sequential expansion of drive mutations? Most of the time it isn't. It's just single expansion that seems to 
adequately integrate the data. So the kind of simplest model that explains what's before us today, but the history of that can be much more complicated. So that's the result. How about incorporating more of the underlying biology? Um, I believe there's some groups out there like systematically making every single possible mutation in proteins to see like what the fitness effect is. Yeah. Could you incorporate like that sort of fitness distribution, like as a, of a random mutation, into your prediction models? Yeah, that's an interesting idea. I, I don't know how we do it directly because of the fact that the, um, the method is agnostic about why things are selected. So you know, it could be that in those measurements, someone says that this mutation in this gene should be selected very strongly, and then we see that gene shape in our subclone, and we measure the advantage of that subclone being equivalent to what's seen in those future experiments. Um, yeah, maybe there's a clever way to do it. But because lots of other people have already addressed that question. So I think one of the main ways to detect drivers originally to make a list of genes that are likely to be drivers is through that kind of um, recurrence, you know, how recurrent is particular mutation type kind of analysis. You know, that, that kind of logic, I think, is the basis of things like music, um, the, the tool for looking at recurrent mutations. Um, so we haven't gone there. The bit I skipped at the end does it a little bit, I would say, how often do we see specific um, residues happening compared to the underlying mutation rate of that residue? Yeah, in terms of the frequency based stuff, we have to try to ask about which clients keep showing up for it. We've been maybe to our detriment more interested in this sort of overall <coughs> dynamics rather than the specifics of the individual genes. I think this, like, the specific gene, like, if the same genes keep showing up in the mutations, I have another uh, question. So now, now people are very interested in all of these signatures that appear in many tumors that you can be composed in the mutation of the different signatures. The CPD, um, BRCA, and uh, for iterations. So um, I imagine that if there is something, for example, an external um, um, like you see in radiation, for example. And that uh, do not correlate very well with time, but there are other ones like CPD and termination and that they, they will. So uh, I'd like you to try to take your uh, the signature, so the data, the composition of the different signatures, and try to see, for example, the each of the MD uh, I mean, if there is something that is a good marker of division or something, is that using only that signature instead of just everything, I mean, that gets better. Yes. Yeah, it's a really good idea. We've done a little bit of it by, um, so at review, and um, it's a very good question. I think it's like how do you know the mutation rate is constant? So we um, see it from the frequency based argument. But another way of looking at it is to say are the signatures consistent throughout the frequency range? Yeah. So we, we have tested that. Broadly, they are in cases that are referred to be neutral. Um, yeah, so it would be interesting. So I mean, some of those here, for example, very well correlated with age, yeah. that then can be used as a, as a marker of, of time, where other ones, I mean, let's say, for example, they should use some mismatch of protein or something, that before the mutation should be very low. Uh, yeah. So before the mutation, very low, it's right after that very time. So, uh, yeah, yeah, true, that can give us back to real time. Yeah, yeah that's right. So I guess that can be a way of, uh, I mean, in this case, a clock there, can tell you something about the number of mutation for any time, and there it can be a clock. That's a great idea. Yeah, because I think there are in many of these cancers, there's a lot of interest in trying to see how for how long the clone has been around before it was identified or something. So uh, I think it would be great. If you're yeah, that's a really good idea. Okay, all right. Well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh,